please join me in welcoming America's sweetheart, Adam Rippon. So Adam, it's been a pretty busy couple years for you, huh? Yeah, and it's all led me to uh, this Google talk. Is, uh, <laughs> it's awesome. the culmination of everything. Yeah, so that's, it is. That's amazing. It's, it is. Yeah. Um, so uh, what prompted you to, to write a book after all these adventures that you've been going on for the past couple years? A lot of people have asked, why did I write a memoir at like 29? And um, because I fucking can. And <laughs> the, uh, the long form answer would be uh, that at this point in my life, I felt like I was um, you know, ending one chapter and beginning another. And I learned so much about myself and I went through so many different kinds of scenarios that I wanted to share those. Um, so the book highlights a lot of the moments in my life where like, I wasn't at my best and um, I felt like maybe I was a failure. And I wanted to share those because in those moments, um, that's when I learned the most about myself. So I, I enjoyed your book so much. Um, you had me at basically the first line of the book, which I'm going to quote. The first time I went ice skating, I absolutely fucking hated it. That really resonated with me because that was my experience as well. I fell on the ice and I broke my ankle. I'm like, I'm never doing that again. Um, you broke your ankle? I broke my ankle, yeah. Um, and I was Is like, that why you wear these? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they provide extra support. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but it, the, like I had to have people lift me off the ice and carry me off. And it was really, oh really God. embarrassing. Standard. Yeah. So I was like, I'm never doing that again. I think that's why I don't have an Olympic medal right now. I didn't want to like <laughs> yeah. rub salt in the wounds. Yeah. But I'm curious, you know, like after that initial bad experience, what made you come back to it and, and keep going? Well, so I'm, I'm from uh, northeastern Pennsylvania, so it's like super cold in the winter. I would go skating and, um, you know, like the first time I did not like it at all. And then um, I somehow got trick and, tricked into going to someone's birthday party, which was at um, a, a local rink that was just being built. And I had already forgotten about this like one experience of where I just didn't like skating. And um, I went, and I had this amazing time. And I kept asking my mom to please bring me back and bring me back to the rink. And finally, my mom signed me up for these group classes and um, as a birthday present. Wow. <laughs> that could have been you. Yeah, that could have that could have been me. You know, yeah. I could have I could have kept at it. Um, yeah. It was you got hurt. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I think what really struck out for me when I was reading the sections of your early years, like I think a lot of people are under the probably the misconception that like being a professional figure skater is super glamorous and it's all wearing the slutty bird costume as you were talking about and going out on the ice and performing for thousands of people <coughs> and then you get stuffed animals and flowers thrown at you and all that other sort of stuff. But it's actually like a pretty grueling, you know, life and also kind of financially precarious at times too, right? You know, being an Olympic athlete is um, just going after that dream is something that can be really emotionally and financially draining. It's it's a really really tough thing to do, and and you know, especially with figure skating, um, it's one of those sports where you see the the culmination of a lot of work, but in in seven minutes. Um, over the course of two days. And then you go back and you go back to this, you know, cold, freezing rink. Like where I trained, what's a Whole Foods but not as nice here in like the area? Sh Shots? Shaws. <laughs> Shaws. Yeah. It was like an old Shaws, right? <laughs> and um, so like here I am training in Long Beach at an old Shaw's and um, you know that's that's what the building was it was you know it was old it was freezing and, and that's where I spent all of my time and then that you know culminates in me wearing like um, you know slutty mesh at the Olympics for everybody to see <laughs> but what you don't see are those like hours and hours of, of work and preparation that go into that um, do you think it was a slut overnight <laughs> <laughs> takes takes years right yes. to, to, to have that moment um, I'm still refining the craft, <laughs> yeah. What really struck out to me too is that like your mom was there throughout that whole beginning phase where, where you're preparing and that seemed like a really positive relationship for you but also somewhat strained at times. You have a parent who's not just your parent but also your manager and sort of your patron too handling all the finances. And like the parts that I thought were really funny of the story were just, you know, you 
uh, like battling with your mom over Instagram, that sort of stuff, like who has control over your career on like every little micro detail. Mm -hmm. uh, so what was that like, just, just navigating those sort of relationships, dealing with family and balancing that with all of your ice skating? Yeah. Um, it was awesome. <laughs> uh, no, it was, you know, there were times we, you know, where I felt like my mom was, you know, micromanaging everything that I did um, because she was doing that. And um, there's this, like, fine balance of trying to be a mom and a manager. And here's the thing. In skating, there's no, you know, you don't get recruited to go to a team and work with a coach, or, and, and then you're on this team, and then you can get drafted to another team. There's no, none of that. The person who picks the coach that you're with and who is going to trust that person's experience is somebody who is your parent and has no knowledge or any clue of what they're doing. So you're asking somebody who doesn't know what they're doing to make these huge, like, life-defining and career-changing um, decisions. So, I mean, it's the blind leading the blind. So how does someone who have, has no knowledge um, of what they're doing make a decision, and then you, the other person making the decision is a 10-year-old? It's how, <laughs> like, you know, that you're set up for a disaster. And then on top of that, your, your, your parent is also the person who is going to financially help you get through all of these challenges. There's no sponsors. There's no anything until you get to the highest level. It's always like... Um, you have to pay for everything and everything and everything. And when you finally can afford it yourself, people are like, oh, it's free for you. <laughs> and you're like, why wasn't it free when I needed it? <laughs> and it can be really grueling. And I think that it was just a balance. And um, I finally got to this point where I was like, I need to try and, and do this on my own. And if I can't do it, if it never happens, that's okay. But at least I'm not going into every event feeling like I, I've put my family at a disadvantage because of my own mistakes. So I, I tried to kind of handle and tackle all of those things on my own. Right, and that leads into the book, like the period of time where you go it alone and you're eating green apples, I think, for a month and couch surfing. What was that like, just that, those first days of that? So when I first moved to California, which was like seven years ago, I moved to this small like mountain town. It was called Lake Arrowhead. Um, no one from Lake Arrowhead. <laughs> so I told everybody, I was like, yeah, LA, because it was like the initials. And I was like, nobody needs to know the, the details. <laughs> and so I'm living in LA. And, um, you know, because it's like this little mountain town, it's like a vacation spot. Um, there's no apartment for me to find. And if there were, I probably couldn't afford it anyway. So m my coach said that I could live in his basement glamorous <laughs> and I lived in his basement and uh, you know the limited amount of money that I had was from a little bit of funding through like US Olympic Committee and US figure skating and that was enough to cover like my uh, training expenses so like my ice time and pay my coach a little bit um, and then costumes and other other like miscellaneous um, you know expenses that pop up for an athlete and one of those was like being a member of the gym because it was like you, you know I need to go to the gym that's one of my like you know you know it's a deal breaker if I don't have enough money to go to the gym that didn't leave a lot of like wiggle room for like groceries but I was like okay I'll figure it out and um, I found this flawless like plan, I concocted this plan that in the gym they had this big basket of like apples and they had like Tezo tea. So it was like broke as fuck, but I was drinking like $5 Starbucks tea and having like green apples all the time. So basically I like hijacked the whole like gym. <laughs> And that lasted for how long exactly? That was about like the first six months that I lived in California. And then you had grocery money after that? or Yeah, yeah. Well, then it was like, I'm definitely not going to get scurvy. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm well, you know, I'm very hydrated. <laughs> Two thumbs up, great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that sort of brings you to the period where the I think the 2014 Olympics are coming up. And that's sort of like, the first, I, I guess that's like sort of like that's supposed to be your time, right? Like everything is preparing for that. So I'm reading along, and then it all sort of falls apart at the last minute. What what was that experience like? It must be like really, really fraught when you're 
preparing for something that happens only once every four years and like everyone's telling you this is your moment and then to perform under that kind of pressure? I think like when everyone's telling you it's your moment, it's I'm I was like the loudest voice telling myself that that you know in 2014 I was 24. That's you know if you haven't made it to the Olympics yet in figure skating at 24, it's like well, to maybe hang them up. Like um, you know it's not like you got it. Keep going into your 30s. <laughs> um, you know look around. Everyone's 15. You know none of the girls have had a period yet. You are fine. <laughs> you are absolutely fine. Everyone's graduated college and you didn't go yet. But like I think um, <laughs> you are on a gap year. <laughs> so it's not like I'm just I'm still young. You're like no, uh uh. <laughs> and so I, I felt like at 24, it's like my last time to ever go after this experience because at 28, maybe I could go again, but I'm not going to go for the first time. It's you know not reasonable. Um, and I. Uh, then not making the team felt like you know I had missed out on this one once in a lifetime opportunity. I I failed, and I felt like my identity was so intertwined with needing to be an Olympian. And if I wasn't, I was a failure. Like there were only two options for me. And um, in those moments, I I just didn't feel like I was good at anything else other than skating. And then also I also didn't feel very good at skating. So it was like, what am I? Time to go back to the shifts. Is that the grocery store? <laughs> Shaw's. Shaw's. <laughs> but close enough, okay. yeah. <laughs> you get it, you get the sentiment. <laughs> go with me. Oh my god, no, OK. So uh, I, you got, I think, the flu or something like that, like a week before the trials? I know, what a like, bitchy thing to say, though. Like, I got the flu. <laughs> but I really did. I was like really sick, so don't judge. <laughs> So I like I Sanders. Here's the other thing I'll tell you. Something. Okay. <laughs> I also like was kind of fat, and, and it was like the <laughs> flu really should have been the thing that helped me, and it didn't. And so now I can just throw it all on the flu. Mm -hmm. No, I just wasn't in great shape. So it didn't work out, but everybody's like, "Oh, you should you should go it again. You should you should do it again." Like, where did you find that sort of resolve to to give it another shot, like knowing that it was like four years away, and that you would be preparing for four years for something that potentially could not pan out again. I had to take it year by year because this time nobody was saying like you should do it again. They were like focused on the younger kids coming up who it was, you know, going to be their time. And I I get that. I mean, I remember being young and seeing somebody who was 25 and was like they're so old. <laughs> um, and I was just thinking that, you know what, I, I'm gonna, I, I just felt like somewhere inside me there was still more to do and I could give more in this like arena of my life. And um, I decided that I was going to do this one last competition. It was the nationals right after, our national championships right after um, uh, the Olympic Games. And it was the next year and I just said, you know what, I'm going to just, train harder than I've ever trained before. I'm going to do it my way. And if you know, it, it, I get 10th, I'm going to be the best 10th place skater from a national championships that ever has fucking lived ever. <laughs> and people will talk like, did you see Adam Rippin? That was the best 10th place finish. I, and I was like, that's all that. Like, I'm going to go and I'm going to give it my all. And I remember I go into that competition and um, I skate really well in the short and I end up fifth. And I was like, I don't feel like I should have been fifth. And I felt like it was um, a lot of people who were judging me. It was their way of saying like, here's a little bit, but like, we're not going to push you. You don't deserve it. Like you, you missed your chance and um, you know, you haven't been skating well the whole season. We're not, you know, we're not going to reward you for not showing up when you needed to. And it f I felt like I was being kind of asked to leave gracefully. And I was like, I'm not, that's, you know, it's, that's not right. And, and then I remembered saying that, you know what, if I, I said if I ended up 10th, I would be the best 10th place, whatever. So if this is the same result tomorrow, then fuck it. Like, that's what it is. And so I went in and I skated this another really, probably one of the best performances I ever had. And I was in first, like I just had gotten all of these extra points that like I had been needed to make up. And I'm like, I'm gonna do it. Like, 
this is a fairy tale. <laughs> and you know, the last person goes out and they skate well. They get second in the free skate, but they win overall. So I'm like, even in my fairy tale, <laughs> like I'm not, I'm coming up short. And then I realized that like, I still felt like a winner. Even if I wasn't the champion, I was the winner. Like I was the one who I felt so proud of. Like that's what really mattered to me. Yeah, the person who won, they, they deserved that. But it didn't take anything away from me. And I always felt that like, you know, if somebody had something, it meant less for me. And that wasn't the case. And it took that moment for me to realize that. That was a turning point where it was more about just doing your best and doing it for you rather than like wherever you're hierarchically ranked among other skaters. Well, it was just such a surreal and bizarre moment where I was like, I could feel like a winner and I could look to the champion and be actually really happy for them because I knew the work that they put in because I had just been so focused on doing what I could do to the best of my ability. And I did that. And I'm sure that they were focused on that too. And, you know, of course they were so nice and kind and, you know, they won. And <laughs> um, I just was really happy for that person because I know the work that they put in, but I was also happy for myself and I didn't feel like I wasn't being a good competitor or a fighter. Um, because I was happy for someone who did better than me. So that, you basically put yourself back in the running that year and then the next year at Nationals. Um, and that brings me to like the point of the book that I felt was the, the most poignant, where you're, you're in the running for the Olympics and you're making the decision whether or not to come out. Um, and I actually, I wanna read a quote, because I thought that was sort of like a really, really beautiful moment in the book. You're talking about your mom here. My mom was scared for me to come out for the same reasons she was before. She didn't want this to be the one thing that kept me from making the Olympics. I decided that if this was the thing that would keep me off an Olympic team, then so be it. Coming out was more important to me. It was bigger than me. It was for that insecure little boy in Scranton I had been so many years ago and all the other insecure little boys out there who I could help. Um, and I thought that was such a beautiful sentiment. Um, and I just wanted to know what was going through your head at that moment. and and how you came to that final conclusion. Well, in 2014, the Olympics were in Russia, and um, right before the games, um, there was this anti-gay propaganda law, which we didn't really know what it meant, but it was the first time that I felt like, you know, I possibly could be prosecuted for being just myself, and it didn't feel fair. And, uh, you know, I came out in my early 20s, um, and so I remember thinking about like, you know, if I was going to come out or what I was actually feeling. And I looked to a lot of people who shared their stories and their experiences. And I wanted to be able to do the same. So after not making the Olympic team, I didn't say anything, but it wasn't a big deal. I didn't end up going. I decided that, you know what, I, this is something that's really important to me. But this is before that competition I just talked about where I had this like amazing skate. So I said, you know what, if this is something I really want to do, I need to be in really, really good shape. I need to be like in the best shape of my life. I need to be like this amazing representative of like my, of my community. Because I was like, I can be gay, but I can't be gay and bad at what I'm doing. <laughs> like, I'm gay and kind of fat and um, not good. <laughs> I was like, I wanna, I wanna be like in the, uh, it, I wanna be at my best when um, I do this. And so um, I decided that uh, I was, after this national championship where I did really well, um, I was doing an interview for this small like skating magazine that goes to all the skaters. And um, I said I wanted to talk about my coming out experience because that was a big turning point in my life and, and as an athlete. And um, I spoke to the journalist and she said, okay. And I said, I just want it like tucked in the story. Like I want, I'm gonna talk about it. I want you to just include it and breeze right over it. Like, you know, anything, anything else. Cause that's what it was for me. So I did and she did that. And I wasn't a national champion yet. I wasn't an Olympian yet. So, you know, it took a few weeks for people to have the magazine to even read that it happened. And when they did, they were like, oh, so it wasn't a big deal to anybody and it wasn't a big deal to me, but it was really important to me that I was able to do that. And then in the long run uh, of then being an out athlete and then eventually making an Olympic team, it turns into a, a, a bigger deal. Yeah, I wanna 
thank you for doing that. Just doing that makes such a huge difference for people. It makes it easier for me and for all the tons of other people to be out on a daily basis, just having people to look to. So I remember when I was younger, there, there, there were, I can't even think of any out male athletes, Greg Luganis maybe, that was about it. Um, so it's, it's just huge to have that. And I think what you know, made it you know, more poignant for me, but also like, more disappointing is that like, there might potentially actually have been some risk in doing that. Like, it, wasn't, it wasn't unfounded. So I think what's interesting, right, is like, nobody thinks of figure skating as this like, bastion of masculinity where like, oh, like, it's such a shock for a figure skater to be gay. But like, I think what you were pointing out in the book is that there is a lot of homophobia and stigma around homosexuality and skating. There's this internalized homophobia, and I found it mostly with like the, you know, so I mean, you can go to a, a competition, and one of my friends recently asked me, she's like, okay, if you were competing in a group of 18 people, how many of the people that you were competing against were like out? And I was like, in a group of 18 people in my last competition, there were two of us that were gay. Everybody else wasn't. Um, and, <laughs> I, a lot of some of the officials that you would come across um, would try to give you pointers and stuff, and some of them, you know, were men and women, and you know, some were gay, some were not, and um, it was always the gay men that would, the gay, you know, judge who would come to me, and they were always the one to tell me to tone it down. They were the ones to tell me to like butch it up. They would, they were the ones to tell me to, you know, not skate like a girl, and. Um, I think it was out of their own insecurities that things like that happened because of the way that they were treated. But there was also this sort of mm, messaging that like if you were, you know, basically the stereotype, it was like, oh, here we go again. And if there was somebody who was not part of the stereotype, it was like, you know, a big push because maybe this is an image that'll be more widely embraced. Maybe this will be the thing that doesn't scare somebody away. Um, and so there was like almost this pressure of like not to be who you are, but I also had this overwhelming feeling that I wouldn't be my best unless I was really honest. You know, in skating, you have to perform different characters along with doing all of these elements and tricks, but I felt that I wouldn't be able to portray these characters through myself if I didn't know who I was. So I needed to really express who I was and able to be the best performer and competitor I could be. So you do that and you win an Olympic bronze medal. So worked Simple out pretty well. that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what, what was that? Uh, what was that Olympic? <laughs> Thank you to all three. Of you. Like <laughs> So tell us what that Olympic experience was like, um, especially, I'm assuming it was Yeah, no Olympic fans. Yeah, yeah, especially, like, I'm assuming it was doubly sweet because you, you just missed out the last time and, like, you, you defied the odds and you made it. You know, I remember when I found out I made the Olympic team and it wasn't this feeling of, like, jubilation. It was just the, the deepest exhale I had ever, like, <laughs> had in my life. It just felt like oh my God, I can breathe. It just felt like this huge weight off of my shoulders because at this point I had already come to terms that if I go or if I don't go, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't define who I am. And I still believe that. And I think it's um, a mentality that helped me qualify and helped me make it. And um, I, I think when I made it to the Olympics and in, in all those in those weeks heading into it, I just was um, in a place of being really grateful and just incredibly focused on doing everything I could to like have the best experience possible, which for me meant being in the best shape of my life, um, meant being so well trained, so ready for anything. And on the flip side of that, it also meant that like, if I were this well-trained, I'd be able to give any interview and, and interact with everybody and, and make all of these friendships and relationships while I was there, because that was the whole meaning and the whole embodiment of what um, it meant to go to the Olympics. And then you skated incredibly well. Um, and I, there was a funny moment in the book you're talking about, like, you know, Leslie Jones's reaction and Reese Witherspoon's reaction, et cetera. And uh, you wanted them to think that you were robbed. Um, so you, you skated flawlessly. And then I think Leslie Jones was like, you were robbed, so. Yeah, so <laughs> it worked. <laughs> so I mean, I knew that I wasn't the best. Like, I know that I wasn't the best skater that like ever lived. You know, 
on paper. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, in my own mind, though, I, I wanted to just give this, um, basically, I wanted, to, I wanted to give you the, like, the Olympic gold medal winning experience because I realized that like the medals were so, you know, based on luck and who, when you were born and what's going on and how, what is the thing that, you know, is judged most importantly now in this moment in skating. So it's just, you know, it's circumstantial. I can't be in charge of those circumstances. Um, you know, you can take any great athlete from some certain period of time and you plop them right into a, a current day situation and they're like not even in the top 10. Um, not to take anything away from what they are or how they pioneered their own sport, but it's, um, it makes you think about, you know, they were born at a great time. They were, they had a mindset and it's all, it, it's all circumstantial. And then I started talking right now and I forgot what you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot what I asked you as well, but but that was that was really oh, good context. Oh, yeah, 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 like I wanted to trick people. And yeah, yeah then right. I did that, yeah. Um, well, I think related to that, right, is that I think figure skating is really interesting because there's this sort of tension between like the technical aspects of the sport and then the artistry. And it seems like nowadays, like the, the technical aspect is so privileged to the degree of it's just like the person is win that wins is the person who does like seven quads, eight quads, whatever it is in a, in, a, in a performance, irrespective of like the artistry that goes into it. And I was wondering like if you have any feelings about sort of that balance between technical prowess and the artistic expression I think, of that. I think it fluctuates. And I think sometimes there's a, a really big push uh, on, on one and then over the other. Um, I also think that like in a way that there is this, um, that um, in skating, the one thing I don't like is that there's always this push where it's like the artist versus the athlete. And both of them are athletic, and both of them have, you know, their own style. So, you know, the athlete doesn't have no style that, you know, the athlete, and the artist isn't a not athletic. But it's this divide of what is basically, especially in men's skating, what is considered more masculine and what is more feminine. And the athlete is always considered to be the stronger person. But it's basically layers and layers upon um, of something based in like misogyny, of like masculinity is considered more um, of a power and femininity, femininity is something considered less than masculinity. So it's all of these layers and layers of, pre, of misconceptions of how people are perceived in the world and how they are perceived as competitors and athletes. And I think um, that when you talk about um, what there's a bigger emphasis on of technique or artistry, I think, um, that yes, it does fluctuate, but I think people sometimes are scared to express themselves. Um, they're scared to show like who they are. They're scared to be vulnerable. Um, but being vulnerable doesn't make you weak. Um, it is, I think, a sign of an, a sign of strength. But I think the best skaters, and there's there's always this case, and I competed against some of those skaters where they combined them both effortlessly and they looked athletic while doing things um, so beautifully that gave them like this artistic edge as well. Yeah, I, I think that's true. Like you, you, need, you need to be strong in both areas and you need to portray that vul vulnerability as well. So, so yeah, so. Is that what you did when you <laughs> skated? <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely portrayed a lot of vulnerability. I think the technical component was where, where I totally fell flat, yeah. um, <laughs> literally as well as figuratively. <laughs> so, so yeah, so you, you do the Olympics, you get the medal and you're like, I'm leaving on a high note, right? Hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> You think I was going to drag my fat ass to another competition after that? <laughs> Some people are like, you're going to retire? And I was like, duh. <laughs> Everyone else is 18. <laughs> so uh, like you've been on a whirlwind with doing Dancing with the Stars and doing all sorts of guest, experiences, uh, guest uh, appearances. Uh, what, what's next for you? What are you thinking about in the next phase of your career? Well, I, I, I can take it from like the moment I'm on like the Olympic podium. 
And when I'm on the Olympic podium, I remember so many people telling me that like this is the moment they waited for their entire life. But for me, it just felt like I could see my parents, my, my mom, so my parent. I could see my mom there and I could think of my coaches. And I, I'm like, this moment is for them. When I leave the Olympics, I realized the moment I had been waiting for my whole life was that whole experience of getting to like entertain people, yes, on the ice, but like also off the ice. And then I've had all of these really incredible experiences post Olympics where, um, you know, I'm asked to do a lot of things and people will rely on me to, you know, be quick and be funny in those situations. So I feel like, you know, I've always been that kind of person. I've always been an entertainer. And now, um, I found myself in this place that I always felt like I, I could be in and always should do. I never found, I never thought of a way to get there, but now I see myself as more of like a comedian, an entertainer. And, um, you know, I've just written this book, and then after that, um, I'll, I'll start filming because I just sold a show to Quibi. Um, awesome. And, um, yeah, and now I'm really famous, so. <laughs> One thing that's really always impressed me about Entertainer Adam is just how self-confident you are and just so how unabashedly comfortable you are with being yourself. And what I found so fascinating about reading the book was that there was so much insecurity and anxiety in, in your childhood life. There's all sorts of silly stories about that. Where did, where did you find that confidence? How did you become the person you are today in that respect? Um, I think that like, there are still those like, insecurities. You know, I, I think that like when I can walk, I can walk into like any rank and for the most part, like be really well received and, and really respected. Like that's my arena. I spent 20 years studying my craft and like I have results to back up like what I had done. You know, yes, it may be an old shifts, sh shots, <laughs> you know, it might be an old shots, but whatever. It might be an old like, you know, old grocery store, but it doesn't matter. I can go into any world championship or Olympic event and the, you know, everyone's gonna say that's Adam Rippon. He's the you know, national champion, he's an Olympic medalist. And even though I feel super comfortable doing like being up in front of people and speaking and, and telling jokes and all of that, I know that you know, I haven't done this for you know, 20 years. I haven't put the same kind of time in like perfecting this side of my you know career so there are still those insecurities but what i learned through my skating career which i bring into like you know me entering my 30s is that like you have to act the way that you want to be perceived and um, if you um, are um, insecure and you uh, hesitate you will be perceived as someone who is insecure and who hesitates so you have to act the way that you want to be perceived. And I think like one of my favorite like things I've ever heard was, um, you know, like uh, Beyonce. She performs, and that's, and that's it. <laughs> yeah. um, thanks for coming. Um, so Beyonce knows, like one of the best singers and performers like of our generation of all time gave an interview and said that she like sometimes doubts and feels insecure when she goes up on stage. Like how could Beyonce fucking Knowles feel insecure? <laughs> and she said she makes up this like persona and that persona is like Sasha Fierce. So Beyonce might feel insecure, but Sasha Fierce is the person that everybody like, oh, like, you know, oh, Sasha Fierce is coming. They, like they, the C's part for her. And she doesn't miss any note, and she gets everybody in the arena riled up. Like, that's the person that does that, not Beyonce. It's the same person, but she thinks of that person being invincible, because she knows Beyonce so well. She knows Beyonce too well. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> I'm fucking Beyonce. <laughs> and I know me too well. And so, when I go into these situations, even though there are those doubts and there are those insecurities, I think like Adam Rippon can go and do that. But like this Adam, I, the, I, the me might be insecure, but Adam Rippon isn't insecure. So he can do that and I can separate and I can almost like act the way that I want to be perceived and I can take that, it, that you know, lesson and, and use it in anything. So your alter ego name is also Adam Rippon. <laughs> It was just easier. Okay, yeah. Sasha Fierce was taken. 
<laughs> works, works, yeah. So obligatory YouTube promo. You just started your YouTube channel, I think, a few months ago. So it's youtube.com slash Adam Rippon. Mm -hmm. uh, so I saw some great stuff on there. So you're doing sort of like a, a break, I think it's called Break the Ice, a talk show interview, but you also do sort of just silly uh, one-off stuff. You got it. OK, yeah. So I do like this Break the Ice, where after Olympics, it was just like everybody I met was like, oh my god, I'd love to go skating with you. And I finally thought, like, why don't I just, you know, I can ask them about like how they became successful and what they do as, um, you know, and all of the things that they've gone through. I could learn about them, but I also give them a skating lesson at the same time. <laughs> so, you know, they're like, yeah, you know, I, I saved the world. And they're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, OK. Um, but it's a lot of fun, and I've had so much fun making like videos like that. Awesome. We'll, we'll keep looking out for them. Uh, we have some time for audience questions, if anyone wants to come up to the mic and ask a question. I was wondering who your role models have been, both on the ice and off. Um, I think, you know, on the ice, I always loved, and I think I grew to love her even more uh, as I got older, was like Michelle Kwan. Because I looked to her, and she was still so successful. And in the skating world, so many people look at her, and they're like, but she didn't win gold. But she, if you ask anybody who doesn't know, you know, doesn't follow skating religiously, and they're like, name an Olympic champion, they're going to go Adam Rippon and Michelle Kwan. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to say, hell yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you how many people have told me, like, you know, Michelle Kwan, you know, the Olympic champion, Michelle Kwan. I'm like, I'm not, yeah, I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I really admire, admired her because she just created this incredible career for herself. And um, she, you know, went on to be one of the best skaters ever. No, did she did not win the Olympics, but she's, you know, a nine-time national champion, um, a five-time world champion. You know, she's like the Simone Biles of figure skating. Um, and then off the ice, I always admired Ellen DeGeneres. And I really admire her because I think someone who's also an out celebrity in the world, sharing their experiences, she shares her experience of being a gay woman really effortlessly and with such a normality that nobody is given the opportunity to um, really give their opinion on what they think about it because she does it so effortlessly and she normalizes it. And I tried to bring that mentality into my daily life and anything I did. Even if I go in and I feel like, you know, maybe these kind of people might not like me, whoever these kind of people are, but I know that I'm cool and if they don't like me, they're probably fucked up. So <laughs> thanks, Ellen. <laughs> I guess I also have to note that your book is dedicated to your haters. Yeah. They don't get enough attention, I know. <laughs> you get it, yeah. I, the, like, the first line in my book is, have you seen that YouTube video where they go to the prison? And um, you're like, this is making a lot of sense for your book. Um, they go to the prison, and it's like the kids meet the inmates, and it's to scare them out. And uh, they walk in, and the one inmate goes, he's like, you're not that cute. Your hair's uneven, and you look dusty. And I was like, that needs to be the opening line in my book. <laughs> and so it is. It's, an, it's a, you know, an inmate talking to a child, <laughs> and it's very fitting. <laughs> that threw you off, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. You touched a little bit on the process where the parent has to pick out this coach for the kid, and nobody knows anything. And like I feel like it's been in the news a little bit with like coaches abusing that power. Like how do you protect yourself or how does the parent protect the kid? It seems like such a fraught relationship. Isn't it scary to think about that yes. you don't know what you're doing and especially now you have to really kind of question who's in in charge. I think that like the the gymnastics uh, scenario really kind of points to like it that was you know Larry Nasser was a doctor like how insane is that it, you know that he was like one of the most respected doctors 
I think there's such a crackdown now on um, the role that coaches play. There's such a zero um, tolerance policy now that I think that in these in these years since um, the like uh, Larry Nasser trial that like it's changing for the better where it you know people are being vetted and um, these allegations are taken seriously right away. There's not, you know, like, oh, you know, you just had a got him on a bad day, or there's like, you, you know, oh, maybe he was in a whatever. There's no second guessing. We like have to listen to these kids and to these people that come forward. Um, and we need to take these, um, you know, allegations seriously. And there's a real changing of the tide and of the guard um, when it comes to issues like that. So I think parents can um, put their trust back into the system a little bit more. But it is incredibly hard, especially when you don't know exactly what you're doing and um, you're trying to make the best decisions for your kids. And then something like this does happen. So it's uh, you gonna there's like networks of like parents that get together and you talk about these coaches and stuff and you try to find the right one. So it's just it's um you know keeping your eyes open and 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 being vigilant to what's happening and then you know when you find somebody you trust you have to just let go and trust them and let them and hope and 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 just trust that they're making the right decision for for you and for your child. One thing I'm curious about as a performer, and like you were talking about, 20 years of work culminating in a seven minute performance or a series of seven minute performances. And I'm curious, like what's going through your head two minutes, 30 seconds, five seconds before you actually start on those seven minutes? Like, are you just totally let, let Reflex you, take over? Or? I can tell you like at, at, at the Olympics and like everything, like there's this such excitement like the day before, I'm like, holy, macro I'm gonna be an Olympian of course like I had these doubts that like I'm gonna break my foot again and I won't ever be an Olympian I'll make it so far and then I'll have to like drag my foot out to the rink once I got past those like there's this like excitement like oh my god I'm gonna do it and then you get ready and you have your practice in the morning and it's all good and then you get ready to go to the competition and there's just like this hour where you're warming up and you're feeling good and a little nervous and then you put your skates on you have your costume on and you're like why do I do this to myself? <laughs> this is so fucking awful. I feel sick to my stomach. I might diarrhea through my costume. <laughs> How is this fair? <laughs> and you go and against all of that, you get into the, your like opening pose and what is, should happen is all that muscle memory all of the training that goes in. You're ready for those moments. And I used to be afraid of that adrenaline, but I realized that the adrenaline pushed me to do things that I couldn't do in practice. So when I used the adrenaline, instead of trying to hold off on it, I actually performed better than I ever did when I was at home. So of course you go from thinking that you're gonna die and diarrhea yourself <laughs> to then five minutes later being like, this is the best fucking feeling in the world. <laughs> and it's, you live for those moments right after because it's like if you can push yourself through something scary, that feeling of elation and accomplishment is so much greater than those feelings of doubt before. You're really authentic and uh, visible on social media. You interact a lot. Uh, how do you balance being an Olympian, training in any respect takes a lot of focus and a lot of time. How do you balance those sort of two uh, spheres? I think now it's easier because like I'm not training for the Olympics. Um, but I think when I was um, getting ready to get ready for the games, I think that like in theory, like athletes are quiet. You keep to yourself and you don't share like your downfalls or your experiences because you don't want your competitors to know that you're like having a rough day. Like I remember there were times where like we have to do these press calls and press conferences before we have like bigger international competitions and it's for like the journalists. I remember specifically like having moments where um, I was getting ready to do one of these calls and I had skated and I had like an awful practice and I go into the locker room and I'm like, oh no, I can't believe it. Um, and you're like, okay, keep it together. Like, let's just do this call. Let's get it over with. And you're like, I fucking suck. Like, and they're like, Adam, how's it going? Like, how are you feeling? And you're like, 
I don't think I've ever been more prepared or ready <laughs> for a moment like this my entire life. I think I'm gonna fucking win. <laughs> and I was like, I can't do that anymore. I'm like, why do we think that? Like, why do we think that we have to give these canned answers when really, like, everybody, nobody listens to them? So I, I thought that I would answer more authentically, and it actually helped to like share that experience because um, you know I wasn't showing you know all my cards, but I was able to kind of like uh, break down that that pressure or that facade I felt like I had built around me, or like an athlete sometimes builds around themselves. Um, so my question is sort of related to the question, the one before the one you just answered. Mm -hmm. When you're actually in the competition and on the ice and you hear the music and you're skating, what do you think about? Are you thinking about the routine, like five steps ahead? Are you thinking about your mom? Like, what are you thinking about? Yeah, so like your heart is beating faster than like it should. <laughs> um, you feel like, you, you, like a million things are running through your head. Um, and the best advice I ever was given was that before you go into a competition, you're gonna choose three key words that you will repeat to yourself. And they're the only three words you're allowed to say during the whole thing. Um, so instead of thinking like, okay, how am I feeling? Because you can question a million things. You can be skating backwards and you're like, do I feel good? I think I feel good. Oh my God, is my lace untied? Am I like, is my, co oh, wait, I can feel like this small itch in my back. Does that mean like the costume's ripping open? Oh my God, I'm gonna have to do the whole thing with a ripped costume open. <laughs> and you can be thinking all this, but I always chose like, I don't remember exactly what my words were, but it was like power, jump, and breathe. And they were just really simple words and they meant something specific to me. Like power meant like really pushing more so than just going fast. I would, it didn't, my speed didn't matter, but if I were powerful, like I would feel in the ice. Jump meant like get your ass off the ice, like jump. <laughs> and then breathe meant like bitch, breathe. <laughs> and I would only repeat those. And I allowed myself to kind of fall in and out of that focus because it's normal. And sometimes then you put this added pressure of like, I can only say these words. Um, so I remember specifically like, um, you know, starting my program and this is crazy, but like you start your program at the Olympics and um, I'm like, I think Britney Spears like might be watching. <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, breathe. And then you kind of get started and stuff, and you're like, it's the feeling is like it's just every other day. Like you've done this a million times. You know it's not, but it feels exactly like that. Like the faces and around you are all the same. And you know, I remember going into like one of my last jumps, and I'm like, you know, you see those videos of like um, uh, Leslie Jones, and if someone falls, she's like, why the hell? Like, get up! <laughs> and I'm like, I don't want one of those videos out of me, uh, like, rolling around like a turtle on their shell with, like, you know, Leslie Jones yelling at me. Like, that's gonna be my legacy. And so I remember thinking that, and then, you know, right away I'm like, okay, power, jump. And I go back to those words, but, you know, there's these crazy things that run through your mind, but it was always like focusing and recentering on these like three things that I knew meant a lot to me. So yes, you think crazy shit when you're out there. Um, things you shouldn't think. Like I don't think I've ever felt this tired in this moment. You're like 10 seconds in. Um, <laughs> so it was just focusing on those right things and, and, and yes, you, you can slip in and out of that, but I, I always grounded myself with like those just three words. It kept it really simple. Everyone obviously got a chance to see the performance at the Olympics, but I'm more interested in the, all the hours, all the, the weeks of training. You know, you're injured, you're hurt, you're sick, you're tired, you don't want to do it. Um, some elite athletes are motivated by either a fear of failure, others are motivated by the dream of glory. Like, what was it, where did you go when you were tired, you were hurt, you didn't want to train anymore? Um, you know, could you talk about that? I didn't realize um, or start to enjoy um, the training or the process until I was in maybe the last two or three years of my career. I'd say the last two I enjoyed it the most. Um, you know, everybody always says, like, it's about the journey. And you're like, what? <laughs> you're like, get me there already. 
And, you know, the training sucks and it's long and it's, you know, you don't want to do it and you're tired and you're exhausted and it's like grueling and like all of those things. But then at the same time, it's like the best thing in the world. Like what's a better feeling than when you've gone to work and you've pushed yourself so hard and you get so much done and you go home and you're like, yeah, I, I did that. I'm pretty like cool. I'm pretty like invincible. And I lived for those moments and I, I took it down to like living those moments on a daily scale of, you know, I even still do it today where it's like if I have tons of shit to do, like I'm so, my best quality is like uh, procrastinating and not doing any of them. <laughs> so I can't wait for like a day if you're like, finally, I have a day to get everything done. And you know, you're busy, busy, busy. You have this day to get everything done and you don't do a lick of work. <laughs> and you're like, well, how did this happen? <laughs> but I'll even write a checklist of like, get out of bed, brush your teeth, wash your face. Because like, I get this sense of like um, accomplishment just so I can go check, check, check. And then I can add the bigger things. I can add like, you know, do this, you know, get this done, write this paper, do this. Um, but like, I've learned that like, it was living for those moments every single day where I felt like I could really have accomplished something. Because it's so easy to think like, I've so far to go, how am I gonna get there? But then I remembered and that's how I learned to um, you know, enjoy the process and the journey. Because I had all of these little moments of success that could lead to a big one. And it meant that much more. So I know you've gotten to do a lot of cool things since the Olympics, Dancing with the Stars. It's going to be really hard to top talks at Google today. But do you have any? I can. Yeah. yeah, I know. So it's all downhill from here. Yeah. But if you were to have a wish list, any wish list items or goals of like cool things that you want to do next? I want to do more things like in comedy. I want to do more things. Um, uh, and like entertain people. It's like where I feel like the most myself. Um, and I think that like, I feel really lucky and I feel like the circumstances and the things that I get to do now really are helping to like prepare me for like another like career defining moment. Um, but I, uh, I want to do more things and if I can find a job or have a, you know, an opportunity to entertain people for the rest of like, my career, then I will have done something that I've loved every single day. This may be a gross question, but... Bring it on. <laughs> I've heard that since the costumes, the figure skating costumes are so delicate that you can't wash them. Mm -hmm. Is that true? If you're fucking nasty. <laughs> <laughs> I have friends that like, they're like, oh, I haven't washed this costume in whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, take it to a dry cleaner. <laughs> like I was dirt poor, but I had like $5 to like bring it to a dry cleaner. So I always brought mine to a dry cleaner, but like I was the, of uh, I was the, you know, finally for the first time in my life, the 1%. <laughs> and everyone else was like, you don't want to touch these. I'm like, wash your fucking shit. <laughs> Cause like every crystal's like, individually put on with like glue. And some of them are like airbrushed and like, Everything is custom made about it. It's like the most delicate thing you've ever worn and you're supposed to do like the hardest things you know how to do in it. Yeah. So there's this fear of like breaking it, but like I was like, I'd rather not smell like a foot. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. What surprised you the most about the Olympic experience and of the celebrities that you met, who has surprised you the most and why? Um, okay, so of the Olympic experience, the thing that surprised me the most is like, it's the biggest competition in your life. Um, and then the thing that shocked me was like, it's not meant for you to skate well there. Like they don't set it up so it's like you're in the best, you know, best time, best circumstances, best this. It's, it's set up so that it can just be live in New York. <laughs> like that's it. Have you asked like any of the mountain sports? Like they, you know, my friends who are skiers, they'll tell me that like, you know, they'll, they will, you know, have to compete in the slalom. But like if the weather's bad, like the event is just canceled. They just don't have the event. At the Olympics, it's like they have the event. It doesn't matter what the weather's like. So these crazy situations happen where it's like people who aren't meant to win, win. 
and people who are just so mentally ready, you could just, you know, park a car in front of them, they'll find a way around it. Like, if, if they were just, like, so in that space, like, I'm gonna win, I'm just better, they still win, because it's like, it takes those two extremes of not expecting anything and, and just knowing, like, without doubt. So if you have no doubt and no expectations, you do well at the Olympics. <laughs> And it's everyone in the middle who is like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> and I had, you know, I had no doubt and I had no expectation. And so I found myself, you know, skating like the best I ever had at the Olympics because I could see how it was hurting so many of my other competitors. They just weren't ready for anything. A and I was. So like, you know, you were in Korea, we have our first practice, it's at like 5.50 in the morning, where it's like, if you think, where do you have to be your most like physically and mentally sharp? 5.50? <laughs> no thank you, ma'am. <laughs> and then like 10.30 is like the biggest moment of your life. You know, every time we compete at a world championships or something, it's like, you know, it's like the May prime time. It's, you know, 7, 8 p.m. You've had the whole day to rest, recover, get ready. You haven't been up for like three hours. You still have sleep in your eyes. You know, it's, it's a totally different experience. The other thing that was really surprising was like, we're in this arena and like, depending on how big an arena is, it's like sits 10 to 20,000 people. When you're at like a world championships or a national championships, it's a sold out arena. It's like the energy is just wild and it's crazy. It's awesome. You go to the Olympics, only half of the arena is sold out. The other half is all desks because the whole one half of the arena is set up for every individual media outlet to have a desk. So for every 10 people, there's one desk with one computer. So in a way, it feels like the most empty arena you've ever competed against, or ever competed in. Yeah, you're competing against the arena. <laughs> it's like me against the music. So you're like in this empty arena that's half full with a camera that you know is being shot out to like everyone in the world. So you're like, how do I make it feel like I feel like everyone's watching when it feels like nobody's watching and it's 10 a.m.? So it was really <laughs> like I needed to like make the moment important for me because all the signs around me were like, it's just practice, like it's not anything important. And it's so, I think like that's what brings like the craziness of the Olympics out or that like all of these circumstances are so not what you've ever trained for. I think there was a part two of the question around celebrities. The nicest people that I've met are also the most successful people that I've met. And they treat people the way that you would expect them to, and that's why they're successful. And, um, you know, like, Reese Witherspoon is, like, really nice. And, like, Taylor Swift, it, like, shocked me how, like, normal and nice she was. Like, she sat with everyone in the, the crew she was with, the makeup artists, and the people that she had in come in for the music video. And I think, like, that is a testament to, like, what true success is is that like the way you treat other people is so important and that's why those people are so successful and it's something that is like a good reminder of like no matter what even if it feels annoying to like treat you know everyone well like oh what a burden <laughs> um, it's really important because like we've all been that person that you feel like at the lowest end of the totem pole and we've all had one person who like probably shouldn't have known our name or known who we were and just said, thank you, that was really nice. And they've singled you out and they made you feel special. And like, if you have that power, you should use it. And it was always the people who were the most successful that used it and they went out of their way. And it was like shocking, but in a really good way. Thanks everybody so much for, for coming.